The United States of America is getting back into the business of leading in semiconductor manufacturing. In the realm of innovation, Secretary Gina Raimondo commands with unwavering resolve. If we do our job, we will be at the beginning of a new chapter of innovation and growth in American manufacturing. We're going to make building hardware sexy again. Sworn in as the 40th United States Secretary of Commerce with the vital mission to revitalize American manufacturing and job creation. Americans don't want a handout. They just want a chance to have a decent job. And so I'm obsessed with that. I was obsessed as governor. I'm obsessed with that now. And the mission doesn't end there. Secretary Raimondo champions empowering women in business to strengthening international partnerships. I think as it relates to China, Europe and the U.S., it's in each of our self-interest to work together. Secretary Raimondo embodies the spirit of American opportunity. Thank you for this chance to work for the American people. Please welcome back John F. W. Rogers. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Atlanta Council, it's a great privilege to recognize the Honorable Gina Raimondo with the Distinguished International Leadership Award. We do so for her pioneering spirit and her extraordinary record of achievement, for her selfless service to people and causes that rise above self-interest or parochial interests, and for her unflinching determination to always do what's right, to find a way forward and to see her vision through. In short, we honor Gina not for what she has accomplished, but what she has accomplished for and on behalf of others. And she does so with grace and with understanding, with empathy, and yes, with a relentless tenacity and a sense of purpose that make her an undeniable force of nature. And I think it was her son who best described it to me, never stand in between an Italian woman and her objective. It's, uh, it's no hyperbole to say that Gina is set apart with a rare handful who come along each generation, the most gifted and self-driven among us, be that innate or shaped by one experiences, with a capacity to help the rest of us not only see what the future can be, but can lead us to it, who can show us the way. You have all heard the expression, it is the hope that kills you. Now, usually that's applied to my favorite sports team. But when you are on Gina's team, it is the lack of hope that is fatal because she views the world through the optimistic lens of opportunity. Rather than dwelling on how difficult things may be, she focuses on getting things done. It's something that I've had the opportunity to witness firsthand, or more aptly put, the privilege to be able to learn from as we've partnered to support programs for small businesses during her tenure as Rhode Island's governor. In a state where small enterprises employ nearly 50% of the private workforce, Gina made it her personal mission to create jobs and opportunities, if not a better way of life for her constituents. From my front row seat, both her efforts and outcomes were nothing shy of awe-inspiring. But I've come to learn that that's just Gina. You know, an English poet once wrote, originality is being different from oneself, not others, which has its, at its essence a message about exploring more, growing more, becoming more than who we are at the outset of life's journey. And from her earliest years, Gina demonstrated a remarkable aptitude for progressive achievement. Further still, it seemed to be a rare sort of success, boldly crossing any lines of expectation. She was always improvising, innovating, pushing boundaries, even her own, showing us that being different from oneself is perhaps the most authentic way to be true to oneself when considering the outer limits of our potential. As an adolescent riding the public bus to school, Gina proved destined to be a trailblazer. She was among the first girls allowed to attend her high school. Not an institutional and an insignificant show of courage and grit for those of all of us here who can remember the tribulation of teenage years. 
She would go on to graduate as the class valedictorian, ratifying her right to be there in spades and paving the way for girls to follow. More than that, Gina showed them what was possible, a real-world application of the adage, if you can see it, you can be it. Continuing on to Harvard, where she would graduate, here again is the top economic student in her class. She would have found new areas for growth, if not her fair share of sprains and bumps and bruises by joining the women's rugby team, which she has since credited as being the good training for her career in politics, <laughs> something that I'm sure all of us here can uh, certainly understand. She would go on to become a Rhodes Scholar and earn a doctorate at Oxford where her thesis on single motherhood and her experiences with housing and poverty clinics inspired her passion for advocacy and eventually a law degree from Yale. Years later, having spent time in the private sector working for a venture capital firm before deciding to start her own investment firm, Gina recounts that it wasn't until the prospect of local public libraries closing the same institution that taught her immigrant grandfather to read English, that she redirected her efforts towards public service, first becoming the treasurer of her state, and four years later, the first woman governor of the state of Rhode Island. And from her perch today as Commerce Secretary, Gina continues to create the conditions for good-paying jobs, thriving entrepreneurship, and a competitive business landscape. In doing so, she is roundly recognized for being innovative, pragmatic, open-minded, and most of all, collaborative. And by the way, if you ever took a college course on legislative process in the U.S., you would come across a book, The Dance of Legislation. And you only need to look at the dance of the CHIPS Act as the case study of how she gets things done. All the while, she has managed to fulfill what she would describe as her most important duties as a spouse and a mother of two. And I'm very happy that her husband is here tonight, Amy, Andy Moffitt, to see her. Let me conclude with these remarks. I think all of you may remember Robert Frost from The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged into a yellow wood and sorry I could not be one traveler, and long I stood and looked down as long as I could. But in the end of this poem, it is all that one road is chosen, took one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, whether that is a satire on decision-making or a commentary on destiny, in any event, in Gina's case, her road has been few would ever be able to take even if they wanted to, as it requires an echelon of insight, tenacity, charisma, and character. As such, by fortitude or fate, Gina Raimondo's road has indeed been the one less taken, and that has made all the difference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Raimondo. Thank you, John. I certainly feel unworthy of this award, but I think I feel even more unworthy of that introduction. Uh, a better friend you will not find than John Rogers, a man of grace, integrity, and passion. Thank you. He knows me extremely well, so I was a little nervous when I heard he was introducing me, so I appreciate the kindness. Uh, a huge thank you uh, and gratitude to the Atlantic Council for this award. And more important, thank you for your work, which has endured for more than 60 years to promote transatlantic cooperation and the core values that have made our world a better place. I also have to uh, congratulate my fellow awardees. Mr. President, congratulations. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your leadership. 
It's quite humbling for me to share the stage uh, with the honorees this evening. I was told, I asked, why would I be chosen for this award? And I was told that it was in part because of the work I've done to advance US national security uh, and the security of democracies around the world. Now, I have to be honest with you. When President Biden or President-elect asked me if I would serve as his Commerce Secretary, truth be told, I wasn't really sure what a Commerce Secretary did. <laughs> then you start learning about the job, and you realize you do everything from running the Weather Service to national fisheries to uh, space commerce to export controls. So really, honestly, there's not much you don't do. But it didn't take me long to realize the absolutely vital role that the Commerce Department plays in ensuring our national security. And here's why. Because our economic strength, our economic competitiveness is national security. The f the <laughs> And that is truer now than it has ever been. Because in the 21st century, this technological age, the source of our strength isn't just that we have the best, most advanced military in the world, although, of course, we do and we need to. But the truth of the matter is that our ability to operate in the world, to lead the world, depends vitally on our economic strength. And as this institution knows well, the world is a safer place when America leads. And our ability to lead depends entirely on the strength of the US economy, its dynamism, and the speed at which we innovate. And so that's why I'm so focused, persistent, as John would say, obsessed, as I have said, with helping US businesses to outcompete and out-innovate and to do that with our allies. Because when I travel all around the globe, I often bring private sector leaders with me, and it's America's brands, Americans entrepreneurs, and our technical leadership that are the envy of the world. And it helps to make the US a partner of choice. But I'll tell you, some of my most successful trips have, inclu have included trips where I've invited a top member of the US military to join me. I've done this several times. Most recently to Costa Rica. I had the great privilege to travel to Costa Rica with the SOCOM commander, General Laura Richardson, first female four-star in the US uh, Army. And, yeah, give her a hand. And why did we go together to Costa Rica? We went together to focus on diversifying and strengthening our semiconductor supply chains in the Western Hemisphere. This helps US companies to be more competitive, <clears throat> to diversify away from just one or two countries in Asia, and it enhances our national security. And as the President just said, it also allows us to show that democracy delivers. Democracy delivers jobs, investment, and opportunity. And so whether we're talking about enhancing supply chain resiliency with our investments in Latin America, working with our allies in Europe, expanding our commercial presence in the Indo-Pacific, it has never been truer that our national security and our economic competitiveness are interconnected and inexorably linked. If we want to secure resilient supply chains, if we want a safe and prosperous future, and if we want to maintain US leadership, it all depends on the strength and dynamism of our economy and our private sector. So that, so tomorrow when I go back to work or later this evening, it means we're gonna get back to work investing at home, investing in broadband, investing in manufacturing, investing in chips, investing in AI. It means we're going to continue to work to deepen our commercial relationships with commercial partners and allies all across the world. 
and it means we're going to work alongside of our allies, many in this room, to fuel innovation and to do it consistent with our shared values. And of course, we must always protect our most sensitive technology from falling into the wrong hands, those countries who don't share our values. So that, now I know what the Commerce Department Secretary does. That's what we're focused on, the Commerce Secretary. And I end by saying none of the work that I do, none of the work that the 50,000 incredible employees that I have at the Commerce Department does would be possible without your support. With partners like the Atlantic Council, every person in this room, private sector, public sector, civil society, we have to stay committed now more than ever. So thank you to the Atlantic Council for your decades of dedication to supporting a strong international system. And thank you again for this great honor. Thank you.